was the inaugural Johann Verhey Memorial Professor of Law and Director of the Center for Business Law and Regulation at Case Western. He also teaches courses in environmental, administrative, and constitutional law. He's the author or editor of four books on environmental policy and over a dozen book chapters. He's had articles appear in the Harvard Environmental Law Review, the Supreme Court Economic Review, and the Wall Street Journal, as well as the Washington Post. He's a senior fellow at the Property and Environment Research Center in Bozeman, Montana. You don't go there in the wintertime, do you? Uh, it was there in December. It was negative 24 without the windshield. God bless you. <laughs> That's God's country. <laughs> he contributes to National Review Online and has a legal blog called The Volok Conspiracy. In uh, uh, 2004, he received the Paul M. Bater Award given annually by the Federalist Society for Law and Policy Studies to an academic under 40 years old for excellence in teaching, scholarship, and commitment to students. It's pretty neat to hear that, particularly uh, in this environment. In 2007, Case Western Alumni Association awarded Adler their annual Distinguished Teacher Award. He serves on the Academic Advisory Board of the Cato Supreme Court Review, the Board of Directors of the Foundation for Research on Economics and the Environment, and the Environmental Law Institute's Environmental Law Reporter and ELI Press Advisory Board. He's a regular commentator on environmental and legal <coughs> issues. He appears on the radio and television frequently, ranging from PBS NewsHour with Jim Lehrer, NPR's Talk of the Nation, to Fox News Channel's O'Reilly Factor and Entertainment Tonight. Please welcome <coughs> Jonathan Adler. Thank you. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm gonna use the, uh, so I'm going to talk tonight about um, the healthcare law. Um, I, should, I should give a little bit of a disclaimer as my bio kind of notes. Uh, I do a lot of regulatory work. A lot of that has to do with uh, environmental policy. A lot of my constitutional law scholarship tends to deal with questions of federalism or separation of powers, basically what we call structural issues, how the different levels of government or parts of the government work together. Uh, my getting involved in healthcare was kind of an accident. <coughs> I contribute to a, a blog, as was mentioned, that's called The Volatile Conspiracy. Um, it's a prominent center-right uh, legal blog um, that uh, uh, gets a, a decent readership. Um, and uh, I should know it was recently, um, not acquired, but we are now hosted on the Washington Post website. Um, uh, they, they started ho began hosting us, I guess, about a month ago. Uh, but we started uh, discussing and debating some of the constitutional issues about the health care law, and in particular the individual mandate. Um, shortly before the law was first passed, uh, I engaged in those debates, um, uh, and they continued really up through the Supreme Court's decision in NFIB versus Sebelius. Um, a lot of commentators think that, that our blog was the home of many of the arguments that were eventually made against the mandate in court. Um, Paul Grave recently published a book that, that um, which I don't really get any royalties from it, but I figured I should promote it anyway, um, <laughs> A Conspiracy Against Obamacare that, that uh, is essentially the greatest hits of our arguments. Paul Clement, uh, who argued the case, wrote the foreword. Um, this is somewhat embarrassing to say. He said that that the, the I'll just read it because it is it is a bit much. But but Paul, uh, coming from Paul, we have to take it seriously. The Constitution had its Federalist Papers, and the challenge to the Affordable Care Act had the Vala conspiracy. Um, I think what he meant by that is he had a bunch of pamphleteers who were just commenting on the issues of the day. Um, but this kind of got us, me and some others, dragged into questions of healthcare policy that really we hadn't intended to be involved. in. Um, the law, as a constitutional matter, is incredibly ambitious, sought to do things, seeks to do things that our federal government had never tried to do before, the individual mandate being part of that. Uh, as I'm going to talk about tonight, in the way it is supposed to be implemented, in the way it actually is being implemented, it also raises some very serious legal and constitutional issues um, that, that are very important and that uh, I continue to be uh, involved in. Um, and, and continue to write upon and, and uh, issues that are, are currently subject to litigation. And I, I keep joking that, that there are all these other things I would like to be working on, issues that, environmental issues, issues relating to, to, to property law or other areas of constitutional law, uh, but this is a question that 
that keeps pulling me back. I feel like Al Pacino in Godfather 3, that he, each time I think I've gotten away, it pulls me back in. And, and so that's what I'm going to talk about tonight, and I will, I will time myself, because I'm a law professor, and so I can fill any space or amount of time that I'm given. And um, so I will, I will speak for probably about 30 minutes or so, and then I'll be happy to take questions until you get tired, I get tired, we're told to leave, or, or the meeting's over. Um, so let me just give an overview of what I, what I want to say about, about the law and some things that I think are important. Um, the, the law, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, was enacted through extraordinary means in a way that laws aren't typically enacted, laws of this sort typically aren't enacted, and that actually has consequences for the way the law looks. That is, the way the law is written, the shape it took, the way it tries to achieve its goals of expanding coverage and reducing costs are in part a function of the way it was enacted. Uh, and uh, I think in some respects provides us a lesson of why we don't normally enact laws this way and shouldn't enact laws this way because some of the reasons that the pieces don't really fit well together are a direct consequence of the way that uh, Congress sought to uh, enact it. Uh, the advocates of the law made some faulty assumptions. A bunch of assumptions about the way consumers would respond, the way states would respond, the way insurance companies would respond, the way health insurance markets would operate that were debatable before the law was enacted. And I'm one of those that think that they were, some of the assumptions were pretty clearly erroneous uh, when the law was being debated, but they were debatable. But we know today that they were wrong. A lot of assumptions about, for example, the willingness uh, with which people would purchase health insurance that was expensive, or more expensive than they had been paying in the past, or that is more expensive than the economic irrational for them to purchase. Uh, that was a, a bad assumption. Assumptions about um, the extent to which there was this dramatic demand for policies for people with pre-existing conditions. Uh, if we actually look at what happens as the law was enacted, the numbers of people that were assumed to, for example, want to purchase policies through higher schools and the like, they're not there. Um, uh, assumption that states would, once the law is enacted, just hop in the line, uh, a, a clearly a faulty assumption. Uh, the mandate the Supreme Court upheld in an odd way, but the assumption that everything else in the law was constitutional uh, was clearly wrong. Well. Uh, seven justices believed that the way the law sought to coerce states into agreeing to an expansion of Medicaid uh, was unconstitutional. Uh, this wasn't a right-left thing. Seven justices thought that, that, this, that, that Congress had, for the, this is for the first time in our nation's history, the Supreme Court had decided that Congress went too far in using money as an inducement for state cooperation, and it wasn't you know, simply conservative justices that felt so. That has implications for how the law operates. Um, the law is still unpopular. That was clearly something that, that was uh, not assumed at the time. Um, and, and what we're seeing today as a result of these first three factors, because of the way it was enacted and what it looks like, because some of these assumptions were wrong, because it's so unpopular, and if it were implemented as written, would be even more unpopular, the administration is engaging in a pattern of ad hoc implementation. Implementing portions of the law when it's politically convenient or not politically convenient, um, delaying things, coincidentally so that certain things take effect just after elections rather than before, in off years and so on, um, because uh, uh, if, if, if the law were any more unpopular, it might be uh, undone. In fact, just yesterday it was reported that um, the administration is considering further delaying um, uh, individual mandate uh, penalty and or the obligation that insurance companies issue policies that provide the minimum package of benefits for an additional three years, and that to make that work for the insurance companies, because the insurance companies get get hammered for this to happen, um, they're talking about extending what's something called the risk quarters uh, for an additional three years. This is a, a portion of the law that's designed, some people would say bail out, some people would say accommodate um, insurance companies in kind of the first several years of, of, of the, the law's implementation, if the risk pools are such that they're getting a, a mix of people that are, that are costly to insure than they anticipated, 
the law provided for three years of, of, of being able to compensate insurers for that. Uh, the law says you can do this in 2014, 2015, and 2016. And yesterday it was reported that they're looking at doing it for an additional three years. Um, uh, so uh, uh, maybe a good idea. I mean, pe some people think risk corridors are a good thing. People that some people that are somewhat conservative think it's actually a reasonable thing to have in the law, given other things the law is trying to do. Maybe. But the law says 2014, 2015, 2016, um, unlike the town in which I grew up, in which a day was once um, declared by city council to last until 3 a.m. because they needed to do that uh, 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 to get some things enacted, I don't think the administration has the authority to declare that 2016 lasts for more than 365 days. But that seems to be what they're doing. A um, little bit of history. Senate, and I'll switch to the other side at some point, so I, or, or keep backing up so folks can see. But um, the Senate, we have to remember the debate. There was a lot of debate about what the law should look like. I'm oversimplifying. But basically, in the Senate, there was demand for a state-based bill, a bill that was not a federal takeover of health care. And so one aspect of that was having state exchanges. Another aspect was not having a public option, not having a federal insurance entity competing with private insurers. Um, there were several senators, some from red states, but some others like Joe Lieberman, who were very insistent upon this. Uh, the House, where, remember the time the House was very firmly in the hands of the Democrats? House did not have to be as accommodated. The House was happy with a bill that was federally dominated. And part of that would be federally run exchanges. <coughs> Typically, what happens when we enact laws is the Senate passes something, the House passes something. If they're different, we have something called uh, a conference, a House-Senate conference. Members of both the House and Senate meet together, and they negotiate, and they compromise. They also, and this again is significant because this didn't happen in, our, in this case, what they typically do is they then smooth the, out the edges. You, you, you make sure all the pieces fit together. You dot every I, you cross every T, you make sure that the cross-references in the bill actually line up. Right? If you're talking about subpart B3, 2D, that there actually is a subpart B3, 2D that you're referring to. The, you, it, the conference is, a, is an opportunity for to really make sure a large piece of legislation actually does what you're trying to do. The House bill and the Senate bill are often negotiating drafts. They're not final pieces of legislation. Well, why is all this important? Well, because after the House passed its bill and the Senate passed this bill, we got him. <laughs> That's Scott Brown. <laughs> couldn't resist Scott Brown. <laughs> I couldn't resist the picture. The, oh, that's Bob Katie. No. <laughs> <laughs> this, is a, this is Scott Brown. Senator. Before he was a senator, uh, was apparently a Cosmo centerfold. So I couldn't resist the picture. But if you all recall, uh, Senator Kennedy died. Uh, there was a special election in Massachusetts. Scott Brown ran in part on, I will be the vote against cloture on a Senate bill. I will, I will support the filibuster. There will not be enough votes in the Senate to enact the law. And he won. And that meant that there couldn't be a House-Senate conference. Why? Because anything that came out of that conference could be filibustered in the Senate. So what would they do? Well, but they decided to do something different. They decided to um, uh, just go with the Senate bill. So the final law that we have is basically the Senate bill. The Senate's negotiating position. The Senate's rough draft. That's what got enacted. It had been enacted by the Senate. The only other way, if you don't have a House and Senate conference committee, how else do you get the law to the president's desk? Well, you get the House to enact word for word with the Senate bill. And that's what they did. They then did something that's also unusual, is they uh, used the process called, no conference, they used a process called reconciliation to enact something called the HCERA. Reconciliation is a, is a process in which you can't filibuster, where you can pass something by simple majority vote in the Senate. But it's limited. Reconciliation is supposed to be about budgetary matters. I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but basically, if you pass something through reconciliation, it has to abide by the budget resolution. We didn't have a budget resolution. I mean, this was done. 
Um, and otherwise, it has to be fiscally neutral or reduce the deficit. So you have to do things that are budget related and they have to be fiscally neutral or they have to reduce the deficit. You can't use reconciliation to enact all kinds of new substantive laws. And so why this matters? Because in this reconciliation bill, they could make some changes, and they made some, but they couldn't rewrite the bill. They couldn't replicate what would have come out of a House Senate conference. So the bill we have is the Senate rough draft. And what's really interesting is at the time all this happened, a lot of health care experts who've been pushing for health care reform were very explicit about what they wanted. They, there was a, a, a prominent letter written by some prominent academics and experts basically saying, this is it. This is the one chance to get this law passed, a bad bill with lots of problems that we're going to have to come back and fix again and again and again is better than nothing. So push it across the finish line, even though it doesn't do a lot of things that we want to do. So when we say, well, this law doesn't do a lot of things we want to do, well, yeah, we knew that. Those who voted for it knew that. The president knew that. They chose a bill that wasn't going to do a lot of things that they wanted to do over not having a bill at all. And that ends up having consequences. Um, in a sense, we got the law that no one wanted. Uh, a law that, were it not for these, this odd set of events, would never have passed the House. Um, a law that was not written in the anticipation that it would actually get enacted, it's also as a consequence a law that does not work. Um, there are things about this law that just do not work the way they were. Um, and uh, it's unfortunate because we're, we're living through the consequences of that, um, but uh, it's a law that doesn't do the things that it wants to do. Um, and in a very real sense, if you remember, as, as the House Speaker, then House Speaker said, uh, we did have to pass them. The bill, so we can find out what's in it. Um, Senator Baucus, who was the, the the putative author of the Senate bill, came out of his committee committee he chaired. Subsequently, acknowledged that he had not read it word for word, uh, and it was his committee draft. Um, uh, and some of what we're finding in the law uh, is not what what we um, uh, thought or, or hoped for. Um, one area that I'm going to talk specifically about because it's something that I've been very involved in. Uh, and there's a lot of litigation on it, but, and I apologize if this gets a little technical, relates to exchanges. As I mentioned, the Senate approach was we're going to have state exchanges. The House approach was we're going to have the federal government running all the exchanges. We know how well the federal exchanges have worked, so you know maybe in some respects it's good that we didn't go the House bill way, um, but it's, it, it's, it's a bit more complicated than that. The Senate bill as written tells states they're supposed to create exchanges. Section 1311 of the Act says states shall create exchanges. But under our Constitution, the federal government can't do that. The federal government can't dictate to states what to do. States are not uh, creatures of the federal government the way, say, municipalities are of states. They are separate entities, entities that actually pre-exist the federal government. Um, so if the federal government wants states to do something, it has to give them incentives. It has to induce them to do it. That's why Medicaid operates the way it does. That's why uh, there are all kinds of conditions imposed on receipt of highway funds. Because the federal government can't just order states around, and the federal government doesn't always want to do everything itself. It, it would like states to do certain things. So Section 1311 tells states to create exchanges. There's some other provisions in the law that give states money to help them set up the exchanges. Section 1321 of the law says, if you don't create an exchange, we, the federal government, have to do it. And so in states like Ohio, um, they refuse to create an exchange. Um, the federal government creates the exchange. What's interesting about the way the law is written is the law does a lot of stuff to the tax code. And one of the things it does to Section 36B of the Internal Revenue Code is that it authorizes tax credits and insurance subsidies, subsidies that go to the insurance companies to make it easier for them to offer the policies in question, um, in state-run exchanges. It doesn't authorize them in federal exchanges. My argument, the argument that I made in a, initially in a paper that, that before I realized that any of this was really going to matter is that's what the law says. Why would Congress do that? Well, we do that because it can't tell states what to do. So how do you get states to do things? You 
give them incentives. One way to give, give them incentives is to dangle money in front of them. The law does that in a lot of places. At some point, they probably figured they'd run out of money. Well, oh, you can dangle tax credits. And in fact, we've seen that done in other areas of the law. We've seen that done in other areas in, in healthcare where the federal government says, if you, the state, operate a program that satisfies our federal requirements, we will give your citizens certain tax credits related, or tax benefits related to that program. Well, so, well that's where the law is written. And simple inducement. Well, it turns out it actually has, this, this, the law being written this way has some big consequences, and some consequences the administration uh, has been trying to deal with. One is this, um, the, blue, the blue states in this map are the ones that created their own exchanges. Uh, Virginia will have to change. Virginia, I think, was just announced last week or so as a result of um, uh, their gubernatorial election, is going to create one as well. Um, a majority of states have not created their own exchanges. What that means is that in a majority of states, as the law is written, there aren't tax credits and, sub and subsidies for insurance purchased on exchanges. That's a big deal because Given everything that's required of insurance companies, all the things that insurance companies have to include in their policies, and the fact that you can't take account of pre-existing conditions and must issue, well, that means the price of insurance goes up. And so the way to make keep insurance affordable is to subsidize its purchase. And that's part of the way the law is going to operate. We know from statements made by members of Congress, Catherine Sebelius, the President, Everyone just assumed that every state would just create an exchange. I mean, they all, they all have Medicaid. Uh, almost all of them implement the Clean Air Act. Almost all of them implement the Clean Water Act. And don't make the federal government do it. Well, we'll just all create their own exchanges. What they did not realize and did not anticipate was that a lot of states wouldn't. And in fact, in 2010, we know in a lot of states in state legislative races, there were a lot of folks elected on, on the basis of campaigning on resisting implementation of health care law, uh, campaigning on, on, on a platform of not cooperating with the federal government. So it means in the majority of states, no, no tax credits. The IRS, despite this, issued a rule that says a taxpayer is eligible for the credit if the taxpayer or a member of the taxpayer's family is enrolled in one or more qualified health plans through an exchange established under Section 1311 or Section 1321 of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and the reason why this is a problem is because the actual language of the law, and I spared you all the slides that get into the nitty gritty detail, say exchange, that tax credits are available in an exchange, this exact words of the, of the statute, established by a state under Section 1311. Now, my naive reading of that is there are two conditions placed on the exchange in which tax credits can be available. It must be established by a state, and it must be under Section 1311. A federal exchange is neither established by a state, nor is it created under Section 1311. Again, so my naive reading, my naive belief that the language of the statute matters is what the IRS is doing is illegal. Well, the IRS has persisted. Um, there are now four lawsuits. Um, I think that might be my next slide. Um, oh, yeah, so here's the language from the actual statute. So the tax credits and cost sharing subsidies are, are available during coverage months. You see again based on the months which you're covered. Coverage month means any month. If as of the first day of such month, the taxpayer is covered by a qualified health plan, that was enrolled in through an exchange established by the state under Section 1311. State is expressly defined in the statute to mean one of the 50 states or the District of Columbia. There is a provision in the statute saying that territories can be treated as states for purposes of exchanges. There's no language in the statute anywhere saying the federal government can be treated as a state, that a Section 21 statute exchange is the equivalent of a Section 1311 exchange. In fact, in the reconciliation bill, with the bill that kind of amended the Senate bill to try and make it a little bit more palatable to the House, there is a provision involving information reporting about exchanges that expressly referenced Section 1311 and Section 1321 exchanges separately. Why does that matter? Because if, as the IRS claims, they're the same thing, there would have been no reason for Congress to do that. Right? The IRS says a Section 1321 exchange is a Section 1311 exchange. And they have a 
wrong, not completely crazy, but wrong argument for why they think they can find that in the statute. But when Congress, the same Congress that enacted the law, <coughs> sought to add an, an a, additional burden on exchanges or additional requirements on exchanges, Congress said 1311 and 1321. Congress knew they were different. Congress knew they were separate. Um, but the IRS nonetheless went ahead with its rule. This is the full, this is the full explanation. For those of you that are lawyers that do anything with administrative law, this was their full explanation. This paragraph. Statutory language, support the interpretation that credits are available to taxpayers who obtain coverage through a state exchange, regional exchange, subsidiary exchange, and the federally facilitated exchange. Moreover, the relevant legislative history does not demonstrate that Congress intended to limit the premium tax credit to state exchanges. They're wrong about that. They, in fact, didn't even look at the legislative history. There, a report was just issued, I guess, last week uh, by uh, the House Ways and Means and House Oversight Committee showing that the IRS really didn't do any inquiry or examination, they were just told states aren't creating exchanges, we need tax credits, we need to figure out a way to fix this, and they did it. Um, uh, according to the state, accordingly, the final regulations maintain the rule in the proposed regulations because it is consistent with the language, purpose, and structure of Section 36B and the Affordable Care Act as well. Again, to me, established by state number Section 1311, two conditions, if you meet neither, you do not pass go, do not have $200, do not have tax credits. But that's what they did. Um, uh, there are a bunch of arguments they try and make. Text, I, well, I mean, it's not, they say intent. They cannot find, there is not a single statement anyone has been able to find by any member of Congress or commentator while the act was being drafted or debated in which somebody says tax credits will be available in federal exchanges. There are lots of people that say they will be available in every state, and in almost every case, those same people say every state will create its own exchange. They believed that. They believed states would, be, would happily do this. They said so. Um, uh, not a single statement. This surprised me. When I, you know, when I started digging into this, because a, a friend of mine and I, we, we did an op-ed about the IRS rule, saying it was illegal, and I kind of thought that would be the end of it. We then said, oh, let's, let's, let's do a lot. Let's look at the legislative history. Let's see what else is there. And it's consumed the, the last few years of my life. Um, we could not find, we, we still cannot find a single statement that, that, in, that just directly says what they said. Not one. Have you been audited yet? Not yet. <laughs> um, they tried some other arguments. Scribner's error. This was a mistake. We, we show, I mean, I have a, for those that are really curious, I have a, People that have trouble sleeping, I have an 80-page law review article that goes through all of this in more detail than you could ever want. Um, it's not a Scrivener's error. It's not absurd results. Um, it was one of the arguments that's made. This is absurd. It would it would mean that tax credits aren't available. Why would it's absurd that Congress would do that? Well, a there are lots of things in the law that are absurd. Um, there are things that are absurd in the exact same way. The argument is well, the point of the law is to make health care available. It's clearly one of the points of the law and to try and make it more affordable for people, at least out of pocket. I try and remind folks that just because it's cheaper for you out of pocket doesn't mean it's cheaper because if there are tax credits, these are refundable tax credits, which means for m in most instances it's actually a, a disbursement from the treasury. And the subsidies to the insurance companies are a disbursement, disbursement from the treasury. It's, you may not be paying out of pocket, but you're paying or your children are paying or your grandchildren are paying, or their children are paying. Um, it gets paid for by somebody. Um, but the claim is, is that Congress could not have written a law that allows a state to frustrate the law's purpose by not cooperating. Maybe that's stupid, but, but Congress clearly can do that. In fact, Congress did that in this law, the Medicaid portions of the law. What did the Medicaid provisions say as written? They said, if you don't expand Medicaid and take the new money we're giving you, we're taking all Medicaid away from you. That means the most vulnerable people in your state now get zero from the federal government. They just assume that no state would be willing to say no under those conditions. But they gave states that choice. They gave states the choice of sacrificing health, health support or support for health care for the most vulnerable portions of the state's population. Medicaid, as it's been interpreted by the Supreme Court, so separating old Medicaid from new Medicaid, still operates the same way. Right? 
the only way the poorest of the poor get this benefit is if the state cooperates. And, wh and why is that particularly interesting here? Well, because if you look at the tax credit provisions of the law, and the administration hasn't tried to rewrite this yet, although, well, they kind of have, but not, not directly, the tax, there are eligibility requirements. One of the eligibility requirements is that you don't make too much money. That makes sense, right? Medicaid is, and so far as the means-based program, you want people that actually need it. And so there, you, there's an income, there's a maximum income for receiving the tax credits and subsidies. But there's also a minimum income. If you make below the federal poverty level, you are ineligible for tax credits and subsidies, no matter what exchange they're offered in. So that means in states that refuse to accept the Medicaid expansion, the poorest of the working poor can't get tax credits. That is the exact absurd result that people try and argue is, is it results if we accept the plain meaning of the statute, the pl a plain meaning of its language with regard to where tax credits are available. And no one has yet disputed that that's what the law clearly means. Why was it written that way? Because they assumed every state would take the Medicaid expansion. They assumed that once this law was passed, the way it was passed and so on, that everyone would have said, oh, okay. We like it now, we're gonna, we're gonna endorse it. And as we all know, that's, that's not been the way people have responded. Um, I say the administration hasn't directly rewritten it because the administration right now is not requiring exchanges to actually verify income eligibility. <laughs> so if you don't make enough money, or even if you make too much money for tax credits, um, the, the administration is not, um, uh, ha is not requiring you to check the exchanges verify eligibility. And the reason for that, they say, is because they haven't yet figured out how to collect the information necessary to determine eligibility. Um, so, it goes. The strongest argument for the IRS rule is, is an argument of what, what we call Chevron deference. It's an argument that basically says, if a statute is ambiguous, the federal government wins, so long as their interpretation is reasonable. Um, it's an old doctrine. Um, again, I think the language established by a state under Section 1311 is relatively clear. I assume that's just because I'm not clever enough to recognize that if you look at the one, squint and you look at the one, it kind of looks like a two or something. But um, there, there, there is an argument, certainly in, this, in, in the litigation that's resulted, one, one very realistic possibility is a lot of courts will look at the statute and say it's long, it's hundreds of pages, it's a mess. Gosh, we don't know, we'll let the government implement it the way they want. Um, uh, again, I think they're wrong, but that is an argument that, that as, a, as a litigation matter, is one that has to be taken seriously. There are four uh, pending challenges to the rule. Um, uh, one in the District of Columbia, one in Virginia, one in Oklahoma, one in Indiana. Um, uh, the one in D.C., the District Court ruled that the statute clearly allowed the IRS rule. Can I? Don't quite get that, but that's okay. Um, that's on appeal. That appeal will be argued for the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit in March. Um, I don't usually make predictions about litigation. I'm confident about one point that this precise holding of the district court will not be upheld. The D.C. Circuit will not say the statute clearly and unambiguously allows for tax credits and federal exchanges. It might say it's ambiguous, so the federal government wins. It might. It might say that the, federal, that the statute precludes the tax credits, um, but it won't do what the district court did. We're waiting on, 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 uh, on these others. Um, and uh, there actually may be a fifth suit filed shortly. So there are these challenges uh, to the rule that are out there. I don't know if I gone for okay, Almost as long as I wanted. So um, this is one example of illegal implementation of the law. Um, there are a bunch of them. The employer mandate delay, which has happened now twice. Um, uh, the delaying of the penalty that employers have to pay if they do not provide their employees with qualifying health insurance plans. Um, the law says that that mandate and the penalty for failing to abide by that mandate, which the administration claims is a tax, um, takes effect in every month after December 31st. 2013. And if it's a tax, that means that tax liability accrues beginning after December 31st, 2013, whether the IRS wants to send people out to enforce it or impose penalties on people that aren't complying or not. Um, the administration has twice said 
um, uh, that they are delaying that that uh, penalty. Um, first, just um, again, first, it, it, just to push it back past um, the 2014 uh, elections. Uh, more recently, they just did it a few weeks ago again, uh, and at the same time. Uh, said the delay would be different for companies above 100 employees and those between 50 and 99 employees, creating a distinction that's also nowhere in the Act. The Act treats businesses with 50 or fewer employees differently than more than 50. It does not create this separate um, distinction. Um, there may be litigation about this. I am, I am skeptical that somebody can demonstrate standing um, to challenge this. Um, the nature of our system is, is that um, not every time the federal government violates the law uh, does that mean there's a court case. Uh, and that's a long-standing <laughs> principle that's the, of the, about the nature of judicial power that goes back to Marbury versus Madison. That as a general matter, the, the president and the legislature's uh, uh, adherence to constitutional requirements is first and foremost something that is our job to, to, see, to, to, see, to see that that happens. Um, uh, and what's always necessary to make something a court case is to find somebody who suffered an injury to a legal, legally cognizable right that a court can consider and vindicate. Um, not, it's not enough for there to be a legal manage. Um So we'll see if that can be sued. I actually had some conversations yesterday with some folks that think they found a way uh, to get into court on the employer mandate delay. We'll see. There's the, my favorite one is the if you like it, you can keep it uh, announcement, right? So the president had promised Repeatedly, and there's a great uh, there's a great YouTube video of like 50 some times of him saying, "If you like your insurance, you can keep it. If you like your insurance, you can keep it." Period. You know, it's right. um, that's not the way the law is written. Right? The law says that um, all insurance plans must offer a minimum package of benefits. There are also rules about annual minimum or annual uh, capping what you can be forced to pay in a year, what you can be forced to pay over your lifetime. Uh, in terms of co-pays and the like. Um, the law had a provision in it that uh, purported to grandfather insurance plans that people already had. The problem is, and for those of you that are really familiar with the way health insurance works, is, is that every year, your insurance provider is going to make little tweaks. There are, new, there are new procedures that are available. There are certain drugs that were generic or now, or that weren't generic are now generic. There are, there's a new network in the area. There, there are always tweaking that plan because the marketplace in which they operate is changing, the, 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 the providers of health services are, are changing, and so there are always little tweaks. And so the, the question is, is how many tweaks does it take to make a plan a new plan? And the administration, before they got in trouble for this, issued a rule saying very little tweaks will cause it to be a new and different plan. Because it's never the exact same plan from year to year. And um, they knew at the time that this would mean millions of people um, not being able to renew the plans they had. Um, that started to happen. People started to get cancellation notices. The president came out and said, if you like your plan, you can keep it. There's a problem, though, is that the law still says the plans are illegal. Um, insurance commissions had already not, you know, had already decided that, that the state insurance commissions decided that that insurance companies couldn't reissue these plans, um, and so there's no authority to say you can keep your insurance plan. Um, the most he could say is, if an insurance company were to renew a non-compliant plan, we, the federal government, will not do anything about it. I don't know if any of you do insurance litigation. But just imagine you represent an insurance company and the plan that you renewed allows for or doesn't have the same cap on, say, lifetime uh, uh, payments by, uh, for, for services by the insured. And you try and enforce that. Right? And the reason it doesn't have that cap is one of the reasons it's less expensive and one of the reasons the person wants to renew it. Right? So you're offering the most expensive plan, but they may have to pay more that Some people make that choice. Imagine going into state court <gasps> trying to defend and enforce a plan that is illegal as a matter of federal law. Is that, is that a case you want? That's not a case you want. That's not a case any insurance company wants to be involved in. 
Um, nothing the federal government can do about that. And the administration kind of knew it. And some of my friends that, that spend their time trying to defend this law and trying to defend everything the administration has been doing to implement this law, they just threw up their hands on this one. Uh, a good friend at the University of Michigan who is always saying, well, maybe the administration can do this, and he was just like, you know, forget it. Uh, there's, it's just, there's just no plausible way that works. Um, there's a debate over a congressional insurance plan. The law provides that members of Congress and their staff have to get insurance um, that's insurance that's through the statute, so basically through exchanges. Uh, and uh, the Office, of, Pers uh, Office of, of Personnel Management and the federal government issued a rule uh, trying, to, oh, trying to find a way around that so that the federal government could still subsidize the health insurance plans of members of Congress and their staff. Um, uh, very creative reading of the statute. I mentioned the risk orders yesterday. These are just some of them. Um, last point I want to make, and then I'll take questions, um, is just a bigger point about why it matters. People often say, well, have other presidents done this kind of thing? Other presidents have certainly implemented statutes in a way that was illegal. And they've often been sued by it, and they've often had rules thrown out by federal courts. It doesn't make it right. We, the rules got thrown out. Um, We've not ever had, to my knowledge, a president that advocated for a piece of legislation very aggressively and then sought to not implement it the way it was written. We've had, certainly had presidents that disagreed with prior, uh, uh, with an, a legislation that had been enacted by and signed into law by previous presidents, and they tried to resist. Um, but certainly not like this. Um, the other reason that matters, though, is that yeah, executive branches sometimes do things they shouldn't do. We shouldn't want them to do things that, that they're not supposed to do. The text of the law is the law that Congress enacts. It's the way our system works. Congress enacts the law. The executive branch is supposed to faithfully execute and administer those laws. Sometimes Congress gives the executive branch a lot of authority, a lot of discretion about how to implement something. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it says, make all needful rules to implement this. Sometimes it says, do this in 2014, 2015, and 2016, period. Sometimes it says, this takes effect after December 31st, 2013. When it does, that's what the executive branch is obligated to, to do. Some of my friends that work in the healthcare area say, well, oh, if, if Obama does this, imagine what a Republican president could do if, if we have one in 2017. Imagine all the things they could just refuse to enforce. That actually scares me. Not because they wouldn't do things that I might, and I might like some of what they would want to do, but that's not the way our system works. We don't want a system in which if you get the White House, anything goes. That is corrosive to the rule of law, it's corrosive to the system that we've created. And so what's going on here, it matters for healthcare, it matters for this law, but it also matters for the system that we have, and, and it's important uh, that that uh, we point out and, and note where a president is is not compliant. Well, I don't think we should talk about things like impeachment. We just point out the president is not faithfully uh, administering the law. That is wrong. Hopefully, where courts can hear cases, they will discipline the president for doing this, or will 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 uh, invalidate these actions. But where not, we should make clear that this sort of thing uh, is is not the way our system is supposed to work. So that whoever is the next president. We've made clear that we expect that president to comply with the law, and if we don't like this particular law, I admit I'm not a fan, um, that the proper way to change it uh, is by winning elections and, and, and having the legislature change it, uh, not by uh, the president pretending that, that you know, he has a magic eraser pen and kind of er erasing the parts of the law that he doesn't like. So that's what I plan to say. I'm happy to uh, take your questions until I'm um, told to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you.